Hello and welcome. I'm HM Friendly. As a bit of an introduction, this is an anthology of science fiction stories that was released in the UK in 1993 when I was 8 years old. It was the first audiobook I had ever listened to, and even though I lost the cassette long ago, it has stayed with me in my mind for 30 years. I finally was able to find a single copy of it, and I wanted to share it for anybody else who may be nostalgic for it. I fully remastered the audio so it'll sound even better than you remember. So here it is, science fiction stories on tape. I hope you enjoy it as much as I have. Fiction Stories. by Anthony Masters. Duncan had never seen anything quite as beautiful as the alien probe that had landed on the space laboratory. His parents had been monitoring it all day. Scientists Tom and Laura Fleming were spending a year on the space lab, deep in the apparently dead moons of the Molonite galaxy. They were taking rock samples from each of the six moons, aided by their technician David French. Duncan had come along for the ride, and although he still had to do his schoolwork by video link, exploring the rocky, desolate worlds had been an amazing experience. He was still hoping that they would find intelligent life, but all that they had discovered so far was a dusty little fossilized plant that looked like a gherkin. The probe had landed in a shower of sparks, hitting the landing platform with a dull thud. Immediately they'd all four put on protective suits and gone out to take a look. The six small moons hovered above them surrounded by the velvet blackness of deep space, broken only by the steely twinkle of some distant star. The first examination had been a little disappointing. It's sealed, said David. There's no sign of a hatch anywhere. The probe resembled a metal egg. Every time Duncan looked at its shiny surface, it seemed to flicker with different colors. It was almost alive, and yet lifeless. What are we going to do, Dad? he'd asked. Mum, Dave and I will take watches. Keep an eye on the thing. Can't I? No, Dunk. You've got exams coming up. Go and get some sleep. Gloomily, Duncan did as he was told. In the privacy of his own cabin, Duncan lay awake, wondering about the glowing space egg. What could be inside it? New life at last? It wasn't fair that he was being left out of the first really exciting thing that had happened since they'd been at the lab. And what about Dave? Although he was in his twenties, Dave and Duncan had become great friends. Why hadn't he stuck up for him and persuaded his parents to let him at least share a watch? Duncan got up and went to the porthole of the cabin. The probe was still there, sealed and glistening, and now anchored safely to the deck. He could see Dave in his spacesuit, walking up and down. As Duncan watched, Dave went over to the probe and put his hand against the side. It began to vibrate. A glow emanated from the egg, dazzling Duncan so that he had to rub his eyes. When he looked again, it was as if nothing had happened. There was the probe, and there was Dave walking up and down. Duncan went slowly back to bed, feeling uneasy but not knowing why. Eventually he slept. Dunk! He was awoken by his shoulder being squeezed so hard that it hurt. Dunk! Duncan rolled over and stared up into Dave's face. Oh, what's the matter? asked Duncan blearily. Something came out of the probe. Dave's voice was tense. What? Come on! He was insistent. We've got to leave in the shuttle. Now! Uh, where are Mum and Dad? asked Duncan, confused and alarmed all at once. They've taken the other shuttle. But what are they doing? He was shivering now, orbiting the lab, trying to work out what to do next. Dave grabbed Duncan and pulled him up. Come on! 
Why didn't they wait for me? They told me to bring you. Come on. What came out of the probe? demanded Duncan as he pulled himself out of bed and hauled on his protective clothing. It's revolting and dangerous. But what is it? howled Duncan. It's like a huge beetle and it's spitting acid. Move! Duncan moved. Soon Dave and Duncan were safely aboard the shuttle and away from the space lab. Duncan flicked on the short range scanner. Where are Dad and Mum? Dave was busy with the shuttle controls. Uh, they're in the moon shadow. Duncan switched to the huge viewing screen, but could still see nothing. Wait a minute. What's up now? said Dave impatiently. We're not in orbit. We're flying! Duncan was beginning to feel uneasy again. Don't worry. What do you mean, don't worry? Where are we going? shouted Duncan, rounding on Dave. What are you doing? We're going to Nebula. What? Where's that? Duncan was horrified. Outside the galaxy. But why are we going there? They need you. Dave's voice was wooden, expressionless. Realization hit Duncan like a thunderbolt. That probe never opened, did it? Silence. There was no giant-sized beetle spitting acid, was there? Was there? Still silence. And Dad and Mum are back at the lab, aren't they? They never went off in any shuttle. The silence continued unmercifully. So what are you doing, Dave? demanded Duncan. You're not kidnapping me, are you? I thought I knew him. I really thought I knew him. The words pounded in Duncan's mind as he stared at the silent stranger beside him. Answer me, he yelled. Then a fist shot out, and Duncan felt his brain explode in a dazzle of shooting stars. He woke with a splitting headache. The shuttle was circling and Duncan realized that they were about to land. Instinctively, he undid his seatbelt and grabbed the controls. Maybe it was a stupid thing to do, but all Duncan could think of was escape. He and Dave struggled at the controls. The shuttle went into a nosedive and the ground began to come up at them with incredible speed. Too late, Duncan realized what his action had done. They hit what looked like a crater, and once again, he blacked out. When Duncan came to, his headache was worse, and there was blood on his lips. Through the broken viewing screen, Duncan could see that the crater was covered with some sort of green weed that writhed and swayed, its color so brilliant that it hurt his eyes. At least I can breathe the air, thought Duncan, although it smelt and tasted metallic. He turned to see how Dave had come through the crash. What he saw unnerved him more than anything that had happened so far. Dave was lying mangled in his seatbelt. There were wires trailing from his shoulders and a dial poked from his neck. Dave! A feeble bleeping emitted from the figure. Dave! shouted Duncan again. Speak to me! But already he had realized the appalling truth. Dave was an android. Cautiously, Duncan examined the technician. He pushed away hair and artificial scalp to reveal a flat disc. It was spinning jerkily, and he could just hear a slurred version of Dave's voice. Bring the boy to Nebula and detain until the probe is returned. Bring the boy to Nebula and detain... There was a grinding, crunching sound, and the voice stopped with a high-pitched squeal. Duncan stood up, not sure what to make of the events of the past few hours. He hauled himself out of the shuttle and jumped to the ground. Once outside, he realized that the craft wasn't as badly damaged as he thought. Although several instruments and fixtures had been shattered on impact, the outer hull was intact. He decided that the green weed must have acted as some sort of buffer. Squelching through the pulsating plant life, he climbed to the top of a small ridge and surveyed his surroundings. At first, he could see very little of interest, but as he stared down at the valley below, a creeping chill clenched the pit of his stomach. Crouched together sat thousands of grey creatures, in dull contrast with the bright green foliage. They were rat-like in body, but with the bald heads of old men. Behind them stood the most hideous sight that Duncan had ever seen. With its rodent-like fur, the monster slightly resembled its comrades. But his head, bald and ancient, was at least four times the size of theirs, and set into his skull was a computer. You are the boy. The voice was soft, 
as if the creature's throat was made of cotton wool. You came with the android. The lights of the computer throbbed in unison with the speech. Yes, I did, but... Where is the android? We crash-landed. He's broken up. The creature turned away and his computer flashed. A section of the hillside opened below them, and a humanoid figure appeared on a hydraulic ramp. Mum! yelled Duncan in relief. You're here! It's all right, Dunk. She smiled her old familiar smile. Don't worry about anything. I'm here to look after you. Duncan's heart leapt. Maybe everything wasn't as crazy as it seemed. Maybe Dave had been telling the truth. But then another figure emerged from the hillside, and Duncan's jaw dropped. It was his mother, again. It's all right, Dunk, said the double. Don't worry about anything. I'm here to look after you. The chief rodent smiled. We thought you'd need a mother, just in case you had to stay, he said. We created her specially. In fact, we created two, just in case there was any defect. Androids, breathed Duncan, beginning to get really frightened. Those aren't my mother. Nonsense, they are perfect mothers, replied the chief rodent. You're in time for tea, said the android mothers, together, in identical voices. I've made the shortbread just the way you like it. You see, Duncan, said the chief rodent, we've learned something of your ways. Who are you? Duncan yelled at him, anger temporarily replacing his terror. I am Fador, ruler of the Nebulans, he replied. We are an advanced civilization, but as you can see, we are grossly overpopulated. We are in the process of searching for a new home. Unfortunately, our scientists misdirected the probe, and it became entrapped on your space station. We need it back, Duncan. And we need it now. Fedor paused. We thought your parents would be more cooperative if you were here, with us. If they send it back, will you let me go? Duncan felt panic sweeping over him again. Suppose he was left here with these ghastly creatures for the rest of his life. He could smell something rancid and rotting, and was sure it was their fare. Yes, you will be returned with our blessing, replied Fedor. Duncan looked at him with deep suspicion. And you will also do us one final service. What's that? Duncan felt himself go cold. You will be a carrier, said Fedor. What of? You must be prepared. What for? Duncan was beginning to get hysterical. As he spoke, a group of nebulans began to move slowly towards him. It won't hurt. Much. Come, Come on, Dunk said his android mothers, briskly. That shortbread'll be cold, and I've opened a jar of your favourite gooseberry jam. Hurry up now. No, yelled Duncan. Keep away from me. For seconds he froze. Then, with a cry of sheer terror, he stumbled blindly back to the shuttle. As he clambered inside, he could hear the nebulans squelching their way through the plants behind him. He breathed a sigh of relief as he closed the hatch and found that the lock still worked. Then he heard the radio crackling into life. Duncan, do you read me? I repeat, Duncan, do you read me? Over. He gave a whoop of joy. The voice was thick with static. But it was mum. His real mum. Duncan grabbed the receiver and began to gabble. Mum, Dave was an android and he kidnapped me to this planet Nebula, and the shuttle crash-landed and Dave's all broken up and these weird rat things are going to make me a carrier. Despite the incredible story, Duncan's mother didn't waste time asking questions. We knew David was an android but you became such good friends that it seemed a shame to tell you. The space probe had a built-in protection unit, which affected his programming. Listen, you'll have to act quickly. It may be possible to reprogram him. Duncan nearly lost the frequency as the shuttle lurched, and he heard a scratching noise at the hatch. They're coming! Duncan yelled into the mic. Duncan, Duncan, don't you want your tea? You are a silly boy, aren't you? The voices of the android mothers penetrated through the thickness of the hull. Duncan tried to ignore them as he listened to the instructions on the radio. Listen, there will be a flap of skin on David's left wrist. Lift it. Got it, he stuttered. There's a mic built into a circuit. Tell David to take off, to return the shuttle to the lab. It was too late. Duncan knew it was too late. Any moment the nebulans would break through into the shuttle. 
In desperation, he yelled into the miniature microphone. David, you must take off. You must return the shuttle to the lab. The android didn't move. David, you must take off. You must return the shuttle to the lab. Duncan was pleading now, pleading with a machine. Still nothing happened. Frantically, Duncan tried again. David, you must take off. You must return. To his amazement, a faint whir came from the silent circuits. The android's hands slowly lifted. They clamped themselves to the controls and pressed the button for the booster rockets. They fired, slightly out of synchronization, and the shuttle, dislodging a couple of snarling, stinking nebulans, rose shakily into the sky. The relentless, Duncan, come and get your shortbread, was cut off by the roar of the rocket jets, and Duncan slumped back into his seat, sweating with relief. The journey back to the space lab was a nightmare of spluttering flight, with the android David rocking to and fro at the controls, his mouth bleeping and his hands erratically darting from one switch to another. The terrifying flight took hours, and radio contact with his mother was frequently lost in static. Eventually, when Duncan had almost given up hope, he realized that the space lab had come into view. Land, Dave! Duncan barked into the android's wrist mic. Land! Slowly! Seconds later, the shuttle was hurling itself at the pad, and he closed his eyes as the cold steel came up to meet them. There was a thumping, grinding sound, followed by silence. When he dared to open the hatch, Duncan could see that he had landed next to the alien probe. It now had a gaping hole in its side. Then suddenly, his parents were there, pulling him out of the shuttle and hugging him so that he could hardly breathe. Later, after Duncan had told his frightening tale, he asked his parents what they had found in the probe. Eggs, said his father. Eggs? Thousands of them. All of them in an incubation chamber that was programmed for Earth. You mean they were going to hatch out into nebulans? One way of colonizing to prevent overpopulation, said Dad. Send the eggs to Earth and start a colony there. And my guess is they were going to make you an egg carrier too. Then they'd be sure of at least one of their evil broods reaching its destination. Duncan felt quite sick at the thought. Anyway, said Mum, getting up from the table, you must be starving. She smiled affectionately at her son. I've made shortbread, just the way you like it. Jan D. Hey, Trig! There's a sea anemone on our garage roof. Of course there wasn't. It was one of those balls made out of fine rubber filaments that looks like a bobble from a bobble hat. But me and Trig called them anemones. We thought we'd get it down. So we took Mum's broom and Trig tried to sweep it off the roof. It wouldn't budge. It stuck. Don't be soft, Trig. It's a ball. If you push it, it rolls. I took the broom and elbowed him out of the way. See? I said, and gave it a hefty whack. A zap! There was an almighty crack and a bright blue flash, and a pain that burned like fire ran up both my arms. Ah! I yelled and dropped the broom. It was kind of mangled and bristles fell out of it, all over the roof. What did you do? Trig was wide-eyed. I don't know. But let's get out of here before Mum sees her broom. So we went to the wreck for a game of football. When we got there, the pitch was cordoned off with orange tape and dangly plastic like you see on TV when the police have found a body. Wow, I said. Scene of the crime. But it wasn't the police. It was a group of scientists. University of Surrey Department of Astronomy, it said on the side of their van. Astronomy, Trigg said. That's outer space and stuff, isn't it? What are they doing on our football pitch? Maybe they're lost, I said, and we bobbed under the tape for a nosy round. Hey, you, out! 
a woman with a clipboard was running towards us. So we nipped back to the other side of the court and pretty sharpish. Sorry, I said, but we always play here. And then we asked her what was going on. Meteorites, she said. A small shower in the night. No giant boulders or anything exciting, I'm afraid. Some quite interesting dust, though. Dust from space? Yes, she nodded. It seems to have scattered far more widely than the meteorites themselves. And you may have walked all over it. Sorry, Trigg mumbled. The woman walked away, and it was then that I noticed something odd over by the electricity substation. The substation is a square brick building, like a shed with no windows, fenced off with sturdy spikes and keep-out signs. Trigg, I said, look, there are some more anemones over there. We raced over to the corner of the field and stared. On the flat roof of the substation there were about a dozen of them. Just under them was the electricity board's warning. Danger. Shall we take a closer look? Trigg asked. No way, I said. There's enough electricity in there to fry us both. And anyway, I nodded at the anemone. They're not very friendly, are they? Look what happened when I tried to get that one off the roof. So we set off for home. But we couldn't get the anemones out of our minds. Where were they all coming from? That evening, halfway through the James Bond film, all the lights went out. Sighing heavily, Dad went to check the fuses. What the... He sounded so surprised that I went out to see what was the matter. Have you been messing about? He asked me angrily. No. He shone his torch on the meter. The numbers that show how much electricity you've used were clicking around faster than a fruit machine. What have you got plugged in in your room? Dad asked. Nothing. Honest. Well, something's draining the system. We're using enough juice to light Wembley Stadium. Just then, Mum called. It's not the fuses. It's a proper power cut. There's not a light on anywhere in the street. That didn't seem to explain the wearing dial in our electricity meter. But it was the only solution we were going to get that evening. And that was the start of it. Next morning, the power was still off. Dad tried to ring the electricity board. Engaged. Again. I think they've taken it off the hook. Calm down, Mum said. Everyone will be ringing them. I expect the exchange is jammed. Things will be better soon, you'll see. But things didn't get better. They got worse. The local electricity supply had failed completely. Only the radio, which ran on batteries, kept us in touch with what was going on. The electricity board was baffled. There was nothing wrong with the supply. Electricity was travelling along the wires all right. But then it was just disappearing, like water running out of a leaky bucket. The whole town was shut down. Mum didn't go to work. Her office is full of electric typewriters and computers. So there didn't seem any point. Dad's garage was closed too. The petrol pumps were out of action. And without the lights, the repair shop was too dark to work in. All sorts of things began to go wrong. The supermarkets were awash with melted ice cream and defrosting vegetables. The smell of sour milk hung over the dairy. The only ray of sunshine in the whole gloomy business was that there was no school. So Trigg and I could do pretty well what we liked. We decided to make the most of it. Let's go to the wreck, Trigg suggested, and see if those scientists are still there. They were, and they were doing some very peculiar things. Are they checking for radiation? Trigg whispered as we watched them. We had a good view, but after our welcome last time, we didn't like to get too close. Maybe. Then I caught sight of a bloke in a long white coat vacuuming the grass. <laughs> he looked really funny. A genuine nutty professor. I wonder if he'll polish the trees. <laughs> it was a great joke. Trigg and I rolled around on the grass, getting covered with bits of twig and leaves. But we didn't laugh for long. As we watched, the bag of the vacuum cleaner began to swell. It ballooned like a huge black pod. Then, with a loud tearing sound, it split. Inside was a mass of seething jelly. Ugh, gross, said Trigg. And he was right. It was repulsive. The scientist tried to switch off the vacuum. But, as his hand reached for the switch, there was an enormous flash of icy blue light and the man shot backwards as if he'd been kicked by a horse. The rest of the team ran towards him. One of them began to press hard and rhythmically on his ribs. Trigg and I had both seen enough hospital dramas to know what that meant. Trigg, I gasped. Is he... dead? Trigg answered. Could be, I suppose. What do you think he was really doing? I asked. 
Suddenly our jokes about mad scientists spring-cleaning the wreck were not at all funny. He must have been collecting something. Samples of something, I don't know. That's it, Trig. I saw it at once. Dust. Don't you remember? That's what the woman told us in the first place. Meteorites and dust from space. He was collecting dust. But when it got in the bag, it must have turned into that jelly stuff. We looked at the group of scientists knelt round the body on the ground. The vacuum bag lay a few yards away. Only the jelly stuff had gone. It had changed again. It was now a huge group of anemones with slowly waving tentacles. I noticed something else, too. Trig, I said. Why isn't the vacuum making any noise? Dunno, Trig answered, puzzled. The generator's still on. We stared at the anemones. They rippled gently, and over them was a strange haze of blue light. They looked glossy and healthy, sort of well-fed. The power's coming from the generator, Trig said, but it isn't reaching the motor of the vacuum cleaner. The anemones are drinking it. They're drinking electricity. He was right. I was sure of it. Then an ambulance arrived. It was horrible, standing there watching. Not like on the telly. It wasn't some actor out there pretending, was it? Some poor bloke was really hurt. Maybe dead. Let's go, Trig, I said. We were in Trig's room listening to music when the most frightening thing of all happened. Ugh, Trig said suddenly. What's that? He pointed down at this little lump of slime on his trainer. Next to it was a speck of pink dust. Within seconds, it too was a blob of slime. Yuck, he said, and tried to scrape them off on the bar of the chair. It was no good. They were stuck. Then they began to grow. Fast. They swelled to the size of squash balls, and then their tentacles began to sprout, short and stubby at first, like fat fingers, and then long and thin, until, in minutes, they were fully fledged anemones. Take off your shoe, Trig, I said. His face had gone all white. Trig, I yelled. He slumped to the floor. His eyes rolled, and when he breathed, it sounded as though he was being strangled. I stared at the anemones, trying to work out what was happening. It was almost like there were vampires sucking his energy out. Then I realized. The human body is a complicated organism, and part of what makes it work is electricity. You've seen those screens in hospitals that draw zigzags to show the rhythm of a heart? The ones that beep for every heartbeat? Well, that's what they measure. Electric pulses. So if something drains the electricity and the pulses stop, I had to do something. These anemones were drinking Trig's electricity, and it was killing him. I grabbed the Trig's shoe and tried to drag it off. Zap! There was a loud crack and flash, and a hot blue pain knocked me down. What could I do? Those things were as good as eating Trig before my eyes. Suddenly, I knew that was exactly what they were doing. Well, if they were hungry, I'd give them something tastier than Trig. I reached for the radio and snatched at the batteries. Once I had them, I put them right up close to the anemones. With a sickening, sucking noise, they slid from Trig's shoe and slimed onto the batteries. A few seconds later, Trig sat up. What happened? he asked. I went all dizzy. Dizzy isn't in it, I said, almost crying with relief. I've never felt more wobbly in my life. It isn't every day your best friend nearly dies in front of you. Over the next few days, everyone realized just how dangerous the anemones were. And it seemed that Trig was not the only one to get too close to them. Over on the new estate, a woman died. The scientists on the wreck were working round the clock. The race was on to find a way of getting rid of these things before it was too late. They tried to poison them, but no matter what they sprayed onto their shiny tentacles, the anemones stayed healthy. Even acid didn't harm them. And they couldn't just shovel them into bags and take them to the dump. No one could touch an anemone. It either zapped you or drank you dry. The scientists tried wearing rubber suits to protect themselves, but it didn't work. The anemones could zap their way through anything. The police sent a marksman in. He settled the rifle into his shoulder and got an anemone in his sights. Ready? Aim? Fire! The bullet whizzed through the air and made mincemeat of the anemone, turning it into hundreds of minute blobs of slime. But within seconds, each blob began to grow. Where there had been one anemone, a whole field of tentacles now waved and shimmered. There seemed to be no way of beating them. The anemones that had tried to kill Trig were still in his room, firmly stuck to the batteries. We didn't dare touch them. We watched from a safe distance. 
At first they thrived, fat and sleek. But after a couple of days they looked dry and dull. They're hungry, Trigg said. The batteries must be done. I wonder how the one on your garage roof is doing. It was okay. Our garage has lights and sockets for power tools. And that thing was up there sucking electricity from the wires like juice from a straw. It was getting dark. The blue light around the anemone glowed brighter in the dusk. A moth fluttered up, attracted by the light. Zap! It was frazzled in seconds. Then there were more of them, drawn by the glow. Go away, you stupid things! Trigg yelled, but it did no good. Why are moths so kamikaze? They stood no chance, and to make it worse, a pair of bats came and picked the survivors off one by one. Rotten bats, Trigg said. But I didn't agree. Are they, Trigg? Are they? Look at that. As the bats circled overhead, the anemone was wriggling. It shuddered and closed in on itself, its blue glow fading. It's the bat, I gasped. It's the squeak of the bat. With every high-pitched cry, the anemone winced and shrank until it was no more than a swollen blister. Then it rolled from the roof and burst at our feet. We leapt back. Who knows what a splash from that thing would do to you, even if it did appear to be dead. It's just a bunch of goo, Trigg said. But I wasn't really listening. We can get them, Trigg, I said. If they zap us, we can zap them right back. Trigg gave me a funny look. With bats. With dog whistles, I said. People can't always hear dog whistles. The sound they make is very high and squeaky, and human ears can't cope with it. Dog's ears are more sensitive, though, and you can get these special whistles that dog trainers use. I didn't have a dog, but I once had a whistle, and I'd had a lot of fun making all the dogs in our road bark, until Mum twigged what I was doing and confiscated it. She had put it in the kitchen on a high shelf. If I opened the back door very quietly, I could be in and out again before Mum even realised. Trigg and I ran to the wreck and made for the substation. The anemone shimmered in their blue glow. You know, Trigg said, I reckon they could swallow the whole world, suck it dry like an orange. I had a nasty feeling that he was right. Hey you, get away from there. A policeman came towards us. Quickly, I blew a long, hard blast on the whistle. The effect was amazing. The cluster of anemones trembled. I blew again. They shuddered, then. One by one, they shriveled up and fell to the ground. I blew and blew until the strange blue glimmer was all but gone and the walls of the substation were streaked with treacly slime. Gross. Mega yuck, Trigg agreed as we watched the last blue light flicker and die. By this time, the policeman had reached us. Heck, he said. I think you'd better come with me. And he took us over to the scientists in their van. From then on, things moved very fast. Some sort of government department, all hush-hush and top secret, arrived and blasted the whole area with ultrasonic guns. We thought we'd be famous, but a special policeman came from London and we all had to sign the Official Secrets Act. Which was a bit silly, really, because we kept hearing about other towns and their strange power cuts. Everybody knows. We're all back to normal in our town now. Almost. It's not quite the same anymore. Every week someone discovers an anemone, in their shed or under their sink or in the airing cupboard. Our town has even got its own anemone zapping squad. They come under the same department as the pest control man. You're never sure what's going to happen, are you? Me and Trigg know that now. On clear nights we look up at the stars and we wonder. My dad wonders too. He wonders about the idiots at the electricity board. They sent out bills, you see. At the end of all the fuss, we got this bill for £2,742.03. Someone in the next road had a bill for almost half a million. Nobody's paying them, of course, but they keep on coming. What are they going to do about it, my dad asks? Cut us off? When you think about it, you have to laugh. Don't you?
The Mars Ark by Helen Dunmore. We weren't allowed to play outside anymore. In the evenings, our back lane and pavements were empty. No bikes, no skateboards, no voices. No kids ringing our bell and asking, can you come out? It had been getting worse for a long time. There just wasn't enough air. At first, you only felt it when you ran too fast or biked too far. Then people started collapsing in the streets. If they were lucky, someone would see them from a house and rush out with an oxygen mask. It happened to me once. I'd been climbing trees and when I came down I felt dizzy and I couldn't see properly. The next thing I knew, Dad was bending over me and I heard the hiss of the oxygen mixture as he held a mask over my face. Then there was the sun. It burned through everything. Sunblock, sun hat, loose cotton clothes, all the stuff we'd been told to wear. The sun flamed white in the sky like a bully which knew it was much stronger than us. It could knock us down any time it wanted. No, none of us went out unless we had to, and our houses all had air pump systems installed, and oxygen seals around doors and windows. Then the schools closed. No school, no playing out, no visiting friends. Project Rescue One took away half the kids in our street. My best friend Nick went with it. Plane load after plane load of kids was airlifted to Siberia, with a few grown-ups to look after them. There were still green fields in Siberia, and streams, and crops growing. They told Nick he'd be able to play out there, go fishing, even swim. It was hard to believe. I asked Mum and she looked away and said, Well, it's better than staying here, but it won't last that long. It's not the answer. Mum knows, you see. She's a climate scientist. Mum couldn't leave her job, so we stayed in our house, breathing the purified oxygenated air that came through the wall vents. Me, and Mum, and Dad, and Bridget. My hamster. I'd had her for nearly a year. She was fudge-coloured with a white patch on her back. She used up oxygen, but not very much. Some kids I knew weren't allowed to have pets anymore. My friend Alex once had a dog, but it had to be put down. His mum didn't want to do it, but there was no choice. Their air allowance was for two adults and two children only, and the air officials said a dog took as much air as a human being. Mum and Dad didn't write Bridget down on our air allowance form. I'd hidden her in an old trainer box inside my wardrobe, just in case. Later on I got her out and held her. She sat up and cleaned her paws and her whiskers, and looked at me, as if she knew exactly what was going on. I'd always wanted to breed from Bridget, but I'd given up hope. People kept their pets secret now. Then, one day, a boy who used to be at my school rang me up. Luke was mad about animals. He'd had a snake in a tank, four gerbils, a white mouse, a couple of hamsters and a pet toad which he kept in the garden. As I picked up the phone, I wondered how many pets he had left. Luke came straight to the point. Joe, you still got Bridget. <laughs> Trust Luke to remember Bridget's name. Animals were like people to him. And he was too clever to say hamster on the phone. You never knew who might be listening. Yeah, I said. Bridget's fine. How old is she? Only about a year. Ham, I, I mean, they can live much longer than that, can't they? Only about another year. That's why I phoned you. Listen, do you remember Glory? Male, chocolate brown. You don't often get them that colour. Oh, yes. Luke had brought his hamsters into school one day. I remember the dark one. I think Glory should meet Bridget, said Luke. The way things are now, we don't know how many of them are left. They don't live very long. We've got to do something. Luke was right. There might be just a handful of single hamsters left, hidden by their owners. And, as I said, I'd always wanted Bridget to have babies. Chocolate-coloured babies, mole-coloured babies, fudge-coloured babies. Yes, I said to Luke. We've got to do it. But how are we going to get Bridget and Glory together? You couldn't even walk down the garden anymore. Then I thought of Mum and the car. She had special privileges because of a job. She was working on a computer projection about oxygen loss from the Earth's atmosphere. Mum was always having to go on the space hopper to the moon base to collect data. And for local trips she had a permit to use her car, even though nearly all cars and buses and trains were banned. She took some persuading, though. Mum, please! Luke's house is only a few hundred metres off your route. I've looked at the map, please! I've got to see Luke! In the end she gave in. Mum would drop me at Luke's on her way to the research station and picked me up when she came back. I didn't say a word about Bridget. I took my backpack with some computer games in it and said I was going to swap them with Luke. 
and I took Bridget, safely hidden in the backpack, nestled up in her bedding with sunflower seeds to keep her happy. I hadn't been anywhere for so long that I was looking forward to seeing all the places I knew. But it was all different, scorched and empty. Dark brown lawns, empty streets, piles of leaves from trees which were nearly bare, although it was only June. Empty shops and our school playground with no kids in it. The bully's son chased us all the way, bouncing off our car bonnet, dazzling in through the windows and hurting my eyes. Luke's hamster came slowly and grumpily out of his bedding, half asleep. Give him a minute, Luke said. He'll be all right. I was worried in case Glory fought Bridget, but he didn't. After a few minutes nosing around, Glory got really excited. I thought that perhaps Bridget and Glory were lonely too, even though hamsters like being alone most of the time. When they'd finished mating, we separated them and hid Bridget carefully back in her bedding. Luke and I looked at each other and smiled. Luke's gerbils had gone, and the snake, and the white mouse, and his other hamster. The toad must have died. It couldn't survive in the brown, scratchy grass with nowhere to hide from the sun. Only Glory was left. And Bridget. Just think, said Luke. Bridget and Glory might be the very last pair of hamsters left in the world. It'll be all right if Bridget has babies, I said. Mum looked tense as we drove home. I was a bit worried that she'd guessed about me bringing Bridget. I'd whistled quite loudly to cover up Bridget's scuffling in my backpack. Luckily, she seemed to be asleep now. Mum? I said cautiously. Is everything okay? It's all right, Joe. It's nothing you've done. Mum's hands were tight on the steering wheel, and she was pale, even though it was so hot. When we got home, she asked me to go up to my room. She had things to discuss with Dad. I didn't mind, because I wanted to smuggle Bridget back into her cage. But the talking downstairs went on and on and on, and I began to get worried. At last, Dad called out. Joe! Joe! Come down here a minute. I could feel that the atmosphere was really tense as I went into the sitting room. Joe, you know your mum's job is very important, said Dad. I nodded. Well, she's been chosen, selected, for a very special project. Not Project Rescue One, I burst out. I didn't want mum going to live in Siberia. No, nothing like that, said mum. It's something you won't have heard about. Something secret. Mum looked sad. Well, yes, I suppose so. The thing is, this new project can't take many people. It's very new, very experimental. It has to be monitored all the time, and that's why I've been chosen. It's called the Mars Ark. It made me think of chocolate. We don't get much of that anymore. You learned about the Mars space station at school, Joe, didn't you? Continued Mum. Yeah, of course we did, ages ago. We'd done it in year four and made models of it in art. Everyone did. Just like you always make models of dinosaurs. Some people said the Mars station was about as much use as a dinosaur. There's a lot more to the Mars station than they've ever made public, said Mum. Since the big changes in climate began a few years ago, they've built a biosphere there. It's like a huge bubble where life can be kept going without help from outside. It's got its own air, water and soil. You can grow plants, trees. I tried to imagine a massive Kew Gardens whirling around Mars. Thick fronds of fern. The sound of water the smell of things growing, birds darting from tree to tree, green light and leaf shadows on your arms, Kew Gardens the way it used to be. It's all gone now, of course. It's ready for a few people to live there, said Mum. I gaped at her. Mum, you can't. You can't go off to Mars and leave us. It's okay, Joe, Dad broke in. They need families now. We're all going. I couldn't take it in. I'd been on the space hopper like everyone else. And Matthew Spencer in our class had done the moonwalk and boasted about it for weeks. But the Mars station? I could only think of my model getting dusty in our classroom shelf. I couldn't imagine going there. Living there. I wasn't sure I wanted to. How long for? I asked. Mum didn't answer. She and Dad looked at each other. Then I guessed. Forever? I croaked. They nodded. Mum swallowed and said, It's an ideal place from which to monitor the Earth. We'll record all the climate changes. Maybe it'll get better one day, said Dad. But even I could see he didn't think that would happen for a long time. And we'd be up there, 
in the Mars Ark. Families and children, growing up, spending all our lives there, forgetting the Earth we came from and how beautiful it had been once. Then I had a thought. Mum, I said, will we be able to play outside there? There'll be other kids, won't there? Mum's face cleared. I'd asked the right question. Of course, Joe. Of course there'll be other children. And you'll be able to play out any time you want. Except when you're in school. School? Oh, but in a way, I'd really missed it. I wasn't allowed to tell anyone where we were going. I had to let them think it was Siberia. It was still hard saying goodbye, even on the telephone. It was particularly hard on Luke, knowing he wouldn't ever see Bridget's babies. No one saw us go. We set off just before dawn in the hot secret darkness. Transfer to Space Connect. Transfer to Space Hopper. Then the great grey Earth ship swam into view, waiting for us, hanging there against the brilliant stars. I'll never forget how our blue and surprisingly still green world grew small outside my observation panel. It looked so perfect. It looked like the one place in that forest of stars where you'd want to live. I had my backpack with me, strapped down safely. Three computer games, my favourite books, photographs of our house, my friends, our school, and under it all, protected by a plastic box with holes in it and padded with bedding and wood chips, there was Bridget. I was pretty sure they wouldn't let me take her, so I didn't even ask. I pretended I'd given her to Luke. The stars whirled and I shut my eyes. Beneath the noise of the earth ship I heard Bridget's small squeak. On our first night in the Mars Ark, I went to sleep to the sound of running water. A thick-leaved green plant grew by the door of our family bubble. The air was fresh. It smelled of things I hadn't realised I'd missed so badly. Damp earth, water, leaves, animals. Our air on earth hadn't smelt like that for years. Of course, I'd had to tell Mum and Dad about Bridget once we were there, but they weren't as angry as I thought they'd be. Mum stood by my bed to say goodnight. Looking back in the direction of our earth, her lips moved, and I knew she was remembering things. People. I woke up at dawn. It was the Mars Ark dawn. Cool grey light filtered through the leaves, and I could hear them rustling. But that wasn't the sound which had woken me. It was something else, much closer. Tiny piping squeaks from Bridget's cage by my bed. My heart went tight in my chest. I thought Bridget must be ill, perhaps dying. The last hamster and she was dying. I couldn't bear it. I didn't want to look, but I had to. And there she was, lying on her side in the cage we'd built the night before, in a nest of bedding she'd scrabbled together, and half hidden under her, squirming and squeaking were her babies. They hadn't got any fur yet, so they didn't look much like hamsters at all, more like fat little pink worms. Their eyes weren't open yet. Seven baby hamsters. I counted them later, when Bridget left the nest for a few seconds to get a drink of water. They'd be chocolate-coloured and fudge-coloured and white-patched and mole-patched. Bridget and Glory's babies. I wished Luke could see them. I remembered what he'd said. Just think, that might be the very last pair of hamsters left in the world. Well, now there were seven more. On Mars. Suddenly, anything and everything seemed possible. Bridget snuggled round and one of the babies squeaked again. I couldn't wait to get to know the other kids so they could come and see the hamsters. I knew I mustn't disturb her now she had her babies, so I didn't try to stroke her. I looked at Bridget and she looked at me with her bright, beady eyes. Then I whispered to her, Bridget, you're brilliant! Graveyard Orbit by Stephen Bowkett. I go by my hacker name, Andy. My real name doesn't matter. Nobody would care anyway. Not now. I have one true friend who's called Altera. She's my spaceship. She's sleek, fast, beautiful and has never let me down. 
What else could a kid of 16 ever ask for? I stole her soon after the gene war started back on Earth. One morning, the sun rose red and stayed red. From the smoke of a million duplicant bombs. Duplicants. People made in laboratories as human as you and I, but treated worse than animals by some barbaric governments. I don't blame the duplicants for starting trouble. More than trouble, actually. They set the whole world in a panic, and, if luck had been with them, would have sorted the mess out quickly. But Earth is protected by WAND. W-A-N-D. Worldwide Automatic Network Defenses. Computer-controlled robot planes. Internationally based, fully armed, with fast reaction times and devastating results. The skies were suddenly filled with smart bombs on the lookout for the enemy. But who could tell human from duplicant? Certainly not WAND. Because in reality, there is no difference. By the time the techs had countermanded WAND's programming, many wars had broken out all over the planet. People fighting people who were, in some regard, different. Tall fought with short, black with white, blue-eyed with green-eyed. But they all shared the same madness, the same hate. Our family lived near a military spaceport. I used my skills to hack into the port mainframe and program the release of a ship. The best they had. Altera. I was going to load up my parents and my sister Becky, and we were going to run, fast, outwards from the sun. The computer accepted my commands. I watched that evening as Altera dropped from a pale sky hazed with smoke and scarred by vapour trails. Then the sound of her engines was suddenly drowned by bomb blasts. Our house and half the town rose up in flames. People were running, screaming, terrified. I couldn't see Mum and Dad anymore, or Becky. Only the fire and the noise, and Altera hovering just above me with the hatchway temptingly open. I took my only chance, strapped in and powered those engines to full acceleration. In orbit. I dropped into warp drive and vanished in a cascade of colour. It was easy. The computer did most of the work. I was free in space, yet trapped at the same time by my own agonised guilt. I listened to the newscasts. A billion refugees swarmed over the face of the planet. Thousands escaped to the moon, or the Earth orbit stations. Hundreds got away to Mars, but only one made it into deep space. Me. And I was the one the politicians were mad about. The one who'd stolen a star-class warp cruiser and hadn't yet been caught. The one who had a battalion of star cops on his tail. Up until then, I'd never really thought of myself as important or special. I mean, loads of people of my age are wanted by the law. It's survival of the fittest, right? And criminals are always zipping along the space lanes being chased by red-faced star cops who can't catch up with them. Although I have to say that I do have a certain reputation by now. After nearly a year, Andy is wanted on three worlds and ten moons for data theft, which is basically stealing information from computers. I'm pretty good with machines. My skills have kept me ahead so far. In fact, they saved my life twelve weeks ago, when the S-Cops chased me into the graveyard orbit. The police lasers melted a slice along Altera's starboard side. She pitched and spun like a piece of silver shrapnel, but thankfully kept her trajectory through space. I was out beyond the orbit of Mars and running hard. The red planet was two days behind me, warp time, and the asteroids lay a couple of hours ahead. I had three cop ships on my tail, all eager to catch me and smash up the data banks that held enough stolen information to earn me a fortune on the black markets of Earth. <laughs> Star cops are not too clever, and their ships are not all that hot either, but they're determined. I knew they would keep coming and keep coming until I ran out of fuel or made a mistake as I navigated through the busy lanes of the asteroid belt. Actually, it's the busiest part of the solar system. There's not only the freight and passenger traffic between Mars and the outer planets, but also all the mining ships that are slowly taking the asteroids apart for their minerals and precious gems. Dollars, yens, pounds, you name it. Money has to be made even when humanity is destroying itself. The stuff that's extracted is shipped to the Mars orbital refineries. What's left? The rock and slag the scrapped machinery and the burnt-out work droids, is rocketed to an out-of-the-way area all spaces know as the graveyard orbit. Once there, so the rumour goes, you never get away. The asteroids would have given me good cover for a later escape, but with Altera damaged I had no choice but to fire emergency engines and vector off into the swarm of debris that was the graveyard orbit. I could see the mass of mountainous rocks and clouds of dust ahead, glinting palely in the yellow light of the distant sun and the more sinister rusty red light of Mars. I could also hear the babble of nervous voices between the cop ships as they realised I was not slowing down, 
but seemed intent on vaporizing myself against the slag heap the size of New York. More lasers cut space like knives around me. Blue laser light, flickering and flaring in the dust that was thickening just ahead of me. The dust particles exploded like firework sparks as the lasers burned through. But now the cops were panicking, veering off, moving out of range. I took a quick aft scan to make sure of that. Then I hit the retro button and was slammed into my seat as the engines came on like the fury of God. The biggest giant in all of space seemed to lift his fist and crash it down on my head. The world turned blinding white around me, and then completely black. Blacker than the void beyond the farthest stars. As I passed out, I woke to Altera's onboard computer speaking quietly into my ear. Andy. Andy. I'm okay. Status report, damage, altitude, and cop ship readings. Are they still round? No traces of the pursuit vessels, Andy, Altera reported. I started to sigh with relief, but the smile froze on my face as she continued. I am being hailed on all frequencies by the ruler of this kingdom. It says you are to leave the ship and surrender yourself immediately. Kingdom? What kingdom? This is deep space, I snorted, annoyed. But for some reason my heart started pounding, and cold sweat beaded on my face. Impatiently, I wiped it off. Give me a link, Altera. Let's sort this thing out. Moments later, a deep and dreadful voice echoed through the cabin. Human. It bellowed. Show yourself. Now. Bow before me. For I am Omicron. It was the voice of my darkest nightmares. Of all the monsters that had ever terrified me in my childhood dreams. I was just wondering whether I'd better suit up and meet this Omicron, whoever or whatever it was, when Altera juddered and I was thrown to the floor. The hull groaned as she was lifted by an immense rockfield grappler, swung over to an airlock and dumped inside. I could hear the hissing of air as pressures equalized. And then, silence. At the heart of which lay the boom, boom, booming sound of vast machinery or maybe the beating heart of a colossus. Leave your ship, commanded Omicron. You will not be harmed. The contrast between its message and the tone of its voice did not inspire me, but I had no choice. I set Altera's computers to self-destruct within six hours if I had not returned. You know what they say, don't get mad, get even. And then I stepped out onto alien ground. I was in a great cavern lit distantly by brilliant lamps, riveted into the high rock ceiling like studs. The rock surface had obviously been covered by a glassy sealant, making this chamber airtight. It was weird and a little scary, but I could survive here. This monster Omicron hadn't destroyed me, yet. I stopped trembling and began to feel a bit more optimistic, but not for long. Something like a gigantic insect, but made of dark metal and flickering strobes, appeared from the far corner of the cavern and whisked me up like a fly. It rushed along with me in its claws, far faster than a man could ever run. Airlocks hissed open and closed as we hurried through. I yelled, I screamed, I swore at the thing and struggled. It took no notice. Soon we reached a room as large as the previous one had been, deep in the core of the asteroid. And at last the vast mantis robot put me gently to the ground, folded itself up, and stashed itself in a niche in the wall. I stood, my heart pounding, aware that I was not alone. Someone, or rather, something, was here with me, all around me. I was inside it. Human, you are a child. Omicron's voice wove into the air itself, much gentler now, much quieter. Millions of tiny star gleams were built into the surrounding rocks, and the air glowed as it spoke in response to them. I thought to myself that I may be about to die, but no way was this creature going to insult me. Watch your mouth, Omicron. Show some respect when you speak to Andy the Hacker. I guess that was that. I closed my eyes, expecting doom to leap at me out of the walls or somewhere. There was a moment's pause, and then the mighty voice of Omicron, Lord of the Graveyard Orbit, spoke again, subdued now and beaten. Master, I obey. I understood two things right away. Omicron was a machine, and it was an incredibly intelligent machine as well. All machines, robots, servos, droids, are programmed to obey a human command. They have it built into their brains, 
Hardwired. They can't do a blind thing about it. Also, if I'd said, watch your mouth to any normal computer, it would have questioned the instruction, not understanding. But Omicron understood, and it complied. <laughs> My heart continued to pound, but now with excitement rather than fear. I grinned. Ideas flared in my mind like a cluster of supernovas. I could hardly speak straight as the plan burst in my head. Omicron, I want you to tell me about yourself, how you came to be here, what your powers and your limitations are, and I want you to show me your kingdom, all of it. I want to see everything. Yes, Master. As you wish. Oh, and Omicron, I added, with just the slightest hint of sarcasm. Please, call me Andy. And Omicron told me, showed me, everything. He showed me the old star freighter, the SF Omicron, that had crashed here a century ago. He had been its onboard computer, a very powerful one, but masterless now. He had taken his name from the wreck and had, by a combination of accident, luck and hardwired programming, become the ruler of this strange place. Omicron introduced me to the droid that had repaired his circuits, powered him up and gave him life again. And I saw the hordes of machines that worked on this mined-out hulk of an asteroid. And the thousands more scattered all across the boulder field of the graveyard orbit. They took apart and sifted the scrap that came here. And they rebuilt themselves and a million just like them. Forgotten by man, they had, under Omicron's leadership, become a civilization. More than that, with each crashed ship or abandoned robot, Omicron's power grew. Onboard computers were drained and their data added to Omicron's memory store. That was how he kept in touch with the gossip of the universe. And he was, I realized with a feeling of stunned amazement, probably the most powerful machine mind in known space. A Goliath of a brain, just waiting for someone to come along and command him. I found myself eventually in the room where the hardware was stored, the shell that housed Omicron's huge intelligence. All of the ports and circuit boards and crystals were standard stuff, so it was a simple job to hack in and further increased my control over the machine. It took me well over five hours, at the end of which time I remembered to belt back to Altera and countermand my order to self-destruct. <laughs> I still lie awake shivering to think that the refuge I'd found for myself could have been wiped out by a stupid mistake, a lapse of memory, my human error, a refuge at the start, but later an empire. And it is my empire, you know. I, not Omicron, have become lord of this dark and forgotten land. I can live here quite comfortably, with everything I need. Oxygen and fuel from the rocks, food and drinks synthesized from their base molecules by a thousand servo droids who tend to my every need. And so, for the moment anyway, I'm happy here. I go by my hacker name, Andy. My real name doesn't matter. Nobody would care anyway. But they will, because I have a million true friends now, of all shapes and sizes. Some can smash mountains. Some can suck computers dry. Some can fly a hundred times faster than Altera's top speed. I have explained the situation back on Earth to Omicron, and we have worked out a plan. It is a plan that will end the gene wars and force Duplicant and Man to fight on the same side against the common enemy, my invading robot army from deep space. Both I and Omicron think the sacrifice of the machines will be worth it. More selfishly, I've used the deep scan trackers to look into the computers on Earth that keep the records of refugees from all nations. I search every day for three particular names, and someday soon, Mum, Dad, Becky, I'll spot you. I'll know where to find you. And my legions will travel with me when I leave the graveyard orbit to make my dreams a reality.